Hello and welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. This is Tom Hayes for the week ending December 2nd, 2021. This is our 111th video cast and our 101st podcast. Uh, so we've got a lot of great stuff to cover today. Um, some great news uh, came out today that we've been talking about and waiting for for the last handful of weeks. So that's really nice to see. Uh, first, I want to thank uh Allie Thompson, Stephanie Brooks, and Brad Smith for having me on Cheddar TV this morning. Uh, nice segment. You can click here to watch it. Uh, we're going to go through some of the details of that uh, later in the call, uh, particularly about the Fed and, and some of the decisions that they're, they're making. Uh, also want to thank um, Alexis Christophorus. Karina Mitchell, Taylor Clothier, and Colin Foley for having me on Yahoo Finance on Tuesday. And we'll go through those in a short while. Also want to thank uh, Brian Curtis, Juliet Sally, Yang Yang, Mark uh, Siniscalci Sinis uh, for having me on Bloomberg Radio on Monday. So it's been a busy week there. And then finally, want to thank Devik Jane and Amber Wark for including me in their article on Reuters on Monday. Um, and this quote was about uh, if Omicron did become a major issue, it would have to be bigger than Delta waves we just went through. There's no question that the Fed taper would either be paused or delay. You may get a little whiplash back and forth with headlines in coming weeks, but on balance, uh, people need to have exposure into year end. So we've seen that up and down each day this week, and now it looks like we're getting a little bit of follow through. A uh, couple of the key quotes I want to cover in the context of this volatility that I thought were important. Philip Fisher, the stock market's filled with individuals who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And you can tell just by talking to people when you talk about a company and they say, well, it's trading at XYZ dollars. And I say, okay, well, what's it worth? What do you mean? What it's what's it worth? Well, what do they do? How, what's their earnings growth? What's their cash flow yield? Um, you know, what what are their growth prospects moving forward? What are their what, what's their earnings growth over the next five years? How's it trading in relative uh, in relation to that earnings growth? And they just have no clue. So you just move on to the next conversation. Um, Peter Lynch, everyone has the brain power to make money in stocks. Not everyone has the stomach. If you're susceptible to selling everything in a panic, you ought to avoid stocks and mutual funds altogether. Uh, that came in perfect handy this week. You know, it's interesting. I went through every single position in every one of my accounts, every client account, uh, every single uh, thing yesterday. And as as odd as a day yesterday was, I was like, if I had available cash, I would buy every single one of these positions right here at this level. And then I went to dinner and uh, there was nothing more to think about. And uh, sure enough, today we just had a rip your face off rally and a home run. So which was which was pretty exciting to see. Charlie Munger, the big money is not in the buying or selling, but in the waiting. There's no question about that. And um, and then finally is uh, Seth Klarman. And I thought this was really interesting. Successful investors tend to be unemotional allowing the greed and fear of others to play in their hands. By having confidence in their own analysis and judgment, they respond to market forces not with blind emotion, but with calculated reason. Successful investors, for example, demonstrate caution in frothy markets and steadfast conviction in panicky ones. Indeed, the very way an investor views the market and its price fluctuations is the key factor in his or her ultimate success or failure. You know, on days like yesterday, uh, you know, I'm looking at like, what do I, you know, what do I have in the portfolio that's at or near fair value that I determined when we went into the position? And can I use that cash to buy some of these that are trading uh, dramatically below fair value? And that's what I'm thinking about as I go through all the positions is how can I benefit from this, this opportunity? Um, you know, the, the, the efficient capital markets theory is nonsense. It's, it's, you know, periods of dislocation when everyone's crazy and you can get great businesses on sale. Uh, it, that, that's how you make your knitting over time. And, um, and, that, and that's exactly what's being served up, whether it's Omicron or it's, it doesn't matter what the headline is. It, it's dislocation creates opportunity. 
and um and that's that and Kalanovic was out with this note who I, I like him quite a bit because we often are thinking along the same lines uh, he says, by the dip as Omicron may accelerate the pandemic's end. Now, I wasn't thinking about Omicron in the sense of, of ending, pa- um, the pan- becoming the pandemic's end. I was thinking about it in terms of Delta, like this, you know, we'll get through this. This is no big deal. Uh, but what he said that was really clever, uh, he goes, Omicron could be a catalyst for steepening, not flattening the yield curve, rotation from uh from growth to value, sell-off in COVID and lockdown beneficiaries and rally and reopening themes. We view the recent sell-off in these segments as an opportunity to buy the dip in cyclicals, commodities, and reopening themes into position to hot for higher bond yields and steepening. Um, Australia's chief medical officer, Paul Kelly, said there's no indication that it's more deadly than other strains. Uh, advocated in... Okay. Oh, what I liked about him, what he said here, it it would fit with historical patterns for a less severe and more transmissible virus to quickly crowd out more severe variants, which could turn Omicron into a catalyst to transform a deadly pandemic into something more akin to a seasonal flu, the JP Morgan strategist wrote in the note. Uh, If that scenario were to happen, instead of skipping two letters and naming it Omicron, the WHO could have skipped all the way to Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the strategist said. I mean, that is valuable research right there. Most of it's crap. This was a great, great note, uh, to say the least. I think that came out after the bell yesterday. Um, uh, from the Jerusalem Post, first signs that COVID vaccines protect against Omicron, the health minister. You know, it's interesting. The, Moderna, I'm going to say something because I, I think that CEO, uh, what he did was complete nonsense this week. And I'm calling him out on it right here because um, so basically Moderna stock uh, had rolled over. And Moderna is great because they been so it had dropped from five hundred dollars down to two hundred ten dollars a couple of months ago, and then like when it was looking like we would need these uh, uh, new vaccines and variants, they're kind of the guys that you think of like oh they can get a new vaccine made in ninety days, and they're so innovative in all this stuff. And he went on because it was in his interest because the stock was down sixty percent and said oh I don't think I don't think the MR, any of the mRNA vaccines are going to hold up to Omicron. He had zero data to say that. And he came out and did that because it bumped up his stock like 20%. And then the, the good news is Pfizer came out and said, not only basically do we think ours will, will handle it with the booster, but we've got, um, we've got the, the pill, um, Paxil did, which is 89% effective, which is uh, pending approval, and um, uh, it's going to work against Omicron. And so he basically shot him himself in the foot, and I think Moderna goes the way of the do- dodo bird, and I think Pfizer's going to run the show and run the whole table moving forward. Um, and, and what was annoying about what this CEO did, and I think completely unacceptable, is in on the same day, uh, he voiced two completely distinctive uh, opinions. So he was relatively sanguine, and then to the Financial Times, he did that overnight article which tanked the market uh, because he, he, he there was no new data that came out to have him change his view. It was just the fact that his stock would benefit uh, on the basis of that. So, you know, the, these guys, y- you have to read between the lines and... Um, you know, understand where they're coming from because that had a big impact on the market and it created a great opportunity. You know, we did top up uh, Boeing on the basis of that, uh, you know, nonsensical movement in the market on the basis of this guy just, you know, basically putting his finger in the wind and making stuff up as he goes along uh, before he had the data, which was really sad to see. Uh, But ultimately it backfired on him because now everyone has in their mind that the Moderna vaccine won't work against Omicron. That's what the CEO said. And the Pfizer vaccine will. And I think that's going to give Pfizer a durable advantage moving forward uh, because they dealt with the facts, uh, not not pitching uh, nonsense. So um, so so that's that. Uh, if you could tell, I don't have any strong feelings about that one. So, uh, okay, Pfizer uh, executive expects vaccine to hold up to Omicron. Uh, that's from Bloomberg. 
Europe finds only mild or asymptomatic Omicron cases so far. Same thing in California. Um, okay, now let's get to the big thing today because um, Baba was trading up. Uh, then it traded down when the SEC put out their recent uh, commentary on the uh, VIE structure. And now it looks like it's closing the day about back to break even, it looks like. So it's basically a non-issue. Um, so the change, what happened is, and, and let's just go through this so we can put it to bed. I think this is going to be a complete non-issue. But the solution, if you're worried, and you know, it's in, a, in, a, in our view, it's such an incredible business at such a great price right now. And we'll, we'll cover a little bit about that, um, that if you want to just own the company and not have to worry about listing, delisting in three years out and all, all the nonsense, you can just call your broker and tell them to swap out your U.S. BABA shares uh, uh, ticker for um, Hong Kong Baba shares ticker. I think it's nine nine eight eight, and you'll get basically you'll you'll get the same type of ownership. Uh, it's just it'll trade on the Hong Kong exchange versus the U.S. Which the, so that will basically, uh, if the Chinese government decides no, we don't want to allow our companies to comply with the PCAOB. Uh, over the next three years, you don't have to worry about it getting delisted in the U.S. three years from now. Uh, and in Hong Kong, the Chinese government's giving them exceptions for the uh, and encouraging uh, VIE structures on the Hong Kong exchange. So it just kind of takes that out of it. And then as all this non nonsense goes on and off about can they list, can they not list, in the US, blah, 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 you won't care because even if the stock goes up and down in Hong Kong, um, you'll just use those opportunities uh, when you have a little extra cash to add to your position and increase your ownership in, in the company uh, and, and nothing basically changes. The only thing that changes if, if they don't come to a resolution uh, over the next three years, then you may see a year or two or two and a half years out that the prices start to diverge. Right now, they're trading in, in concert, you know, meaning if it's up 2% in Hong Kong, it's up 2% in the U.S. and vice versa. Uh, whereas, you know, as you get closer to that three-year kind of cutoff, you may see that, you know, Hong Kong is up 2%, U.S. is up a half a percent. That's when you start have to start to worry. We're far away away from there, but um, the solution is easy and you can do it now. If, you, if you're worried about that, just swap out to Hong Kong shares. Not a horrible thing to do, uh, but I, I, I think will ultimately prove to be unnecessary. Um, and if we move ahead on that front, it'll just be on the stock. We, we won't touch the options um, and, and do it that way. So anyway, so here's the deal. What, what change did the U.S. make? Under a law signed in December 2020 by President Trump, a month before he left office, Chinese companies may face delisting starting in 2024 if they refuse to show financial information to American regulators. Uh, rules developed by the U.S. SEC to carry out the law require that audits done for Chinese companies be made available for inspection by the U.S. Public Counting U, uh, PCAOB, okay, U.S. Public Count Company Accounting Oversight Board, and a quasi-governmental body uh, created by Congress two decades ago to improve the integrity of audits. China has refused to let the PCAOB examine the audits of its firm, citing national security concerns. On its website, the PCAOB lists close to 50 countries where it's uh, been given access to company audits, and just one China where access has been denied. What change did China's make? In July, China's internet regulator uh, said companies hoping to go public outside the mainland will first be required to undergo cybersecurity and national security reviews if they hold data on at least a billion people. Many of China's technology firms have near monopoly in their fields and vast control of user data, and the Chinese Communist Party appears intent on making sure that sensitive data can't be accessed by foreign regulators. A month earlier, uh, the ride-hailing company Didi had rankled Beijing by proceeding with its U.S. IPO, shepherded by the who's who of Wall Street banks. Even after authorities had expressed concerns over the security practices, China regulators have asked DD executives to pre prepare for a possible delisting from U.S. bourses, according to people close to the matter. So, the, okay, um, 
Is China trying to discourage foreign ownership of its companies? Quite the opposite. China has opened the door to full foreign ownership of financial service companies and local banks in recent years through the strict those strict limits remain on foreign investment in certain areas, at, such as internet, transportation, mining, and media companies. The so-called variable interest entity VIE structure was developed as a way around those limits. Under the VIE, which was pioneered by now private Sina Corp in 2000, a Chinese company receives foreign investment via shell company incorporated in such places as the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands outside the purview of Chinese regulators. Legally shaken, hard to understand, the solution nonetheless proved acceptable to U.S. investors, Wall Street, and the Communist Party alike. Uh, what could be coming next? In July 2021, Chinese regulators said they're to be considering requiring firms that have already gone pub public using the VIE structure to seek approval for additional share offerings. Not their current listing, but additional share offerings. Um, this category includes Didi as well as e-commerce giant Alibaba, which raised $25 billion in a 2014 debut listing on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, okay, uh, already SEC. Okay, so, so that's the story. So today the SEC kind of uh, put that out. Uh, for a press relief, rules set forth the submission and disclosure of requirements mandated by the Act. So starting next year, they have to do that three years in a row. So that, that's what gives the 2024 deadline. If they haven't met allowing the PCAOB, uh, then they will uh, potentially be delisted at the end of 2024. Uh, SEC finalizes rules that allow it to delist foreign stocks for failure to meet audit requirements. Um, so, you know, so these stocks, like the algos traded them down as soon as that hit the tape. And now it looks like they're going to close potentially positive because it was already known. It was just an automatic uh, re reply. But again, if you just, if you love the business and more than that, love the business at this price, um, and you don't want to think about the the two share listings diverging a couple years from now, you can just do that now and then you can focus on the business and every time you get one of these silly headlines, if you've got cash around, you can just add to it uh, over time and uh, and get a double over the next couple of years, double, triple maybe, uh, based on some, some of the things that we believe about the business and the company. So, um, okay. Uh, all right, so the most important quote in this CNBC article was that uh, from Brendan Ahern, because he's got the most to lose. He's got an $8 billion China Internet e ETF called uh, uh, KWeb. And he goes, this is a tough situation because the companies are being held hostage. It's the Chinese regulators who are preventing the U.S. regulators from inspecting the audits, Ahern said. The issue, unfortunately, has been politicized. These companies are all audited by the big four accounting firms, but under Chinese law, regulators are not allowing those audits to be sent to the PCAOB. What you have is Chinese law clashing with U.S. law. This needs to be dealt with above the regulator level, perhaps at the trade representative level, or perhaps a phone call between Xi and Biden. Uh, those, the lose, uh, the people getting hurt are the ones that, which own the stock, which are U.S. investors, which I'm sure the SEC doesn't want. So, um, now, if you look at his fund, the ETF, uh, they own all ADRs. So uh, this is not a pressing issue for them with $8 billion of, of assets. Uh, maybe they'll switch these out over time. But if you look, they have uh, JD is 10% of their fund, which is an ADR. That's about $850 million position. Their Alibaba holding is in the U.S. shares, not the Hong Kong shares. That's 7.7% of their fund, $627 million. Same thing with NetEase, Pinduoduo, uh, Ctrip, uh, uh, Trip.com, rather, Baidu. These are all ADRs. Their top 10 positions in the fund are ADRs uh, or it looks like these two might be over the counter, uh, Tencent and Mushan. Uh, it's unclear. I don't. Uh, th this identifier looks like a U.S. Qsip, so therefore it might be an over the counter. Uh, that seems like an awful lot of money to have in an over counter. But um, I'll look at their perspective. But nonetheless, um, the vast majority of of their eight billion dollar fund is still in a ADRs, and they know this thing 
better than anyone else because they live, eat, and breathe it. So, you know, I just follow the money on these things. Uh, but again, it's easy enough to call your broker and swap it out. Um, okay, now, as for China itself, the, uh, this, you know, I said earlier in the year, they are going to slow down because they tightened while everyone else was easing. Uh, now I think that's going to change. I think the rest of the world is starting to tighten and they're going to have to ease in accordance with the four pillars of the bull thesis for the next 12 months that we went over last week. Uh, but we saw this week the industrial profit growth rebounded for the second month. Um, also, uh, we've got more of this VIE stuff. All right, hold on for a second. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, there was one thing um yeah the the basic point is that the chinese government is giving a nod to um the vie structure in hong kong so um that that's really the the key takeaway from some of these articles ah this is a this is a critical point so if you remember from last week, we said that we believed the Chinese government would start to ease policy ahead of the uh, China National Congress in November, as they do every five years. And that's why the K uh, China MSCI tends to perform on average 30, it was either 30 or 31 percent in the 12 months leading up to the China National Congress. Well, sure enough, on Sunday, this came out, PBOC uh, official says China to maintain ample liquidity. China will pursue prudent monetary policy and maintain ample liquidity in order to support employment, China.com cited, a central bank official as saying, liquidity can be ensured through the issuance of special local bonds and via other ways of replenishing bank capital. Wang Jin, director general of the Research Bar, uh, Bureau at PBOC, told the Kaijing annual conference this week, According to the Internet portal, the PBOC will also promote the reform of rural, co rural credit cooperatives, step up the disposal of non-performing assets, and address financial risks at small and medium-sized institutions. China will pursue more active economic policies next year, Li, Li Yang, chairman of the National Institute for Finance and Development, told the same conference, according to the Beijing News. Monetary and fiscal policies this year have been slightly restrained, he said. Li's institution is the think tank affiliated with the Chinese Academy of Science. So, like I said, they were tightening this year when the rest of the world was adding liquidity. Next year, they're going to be loosening and easing policy into the China National Congress meeting, as they do every five years, juice up the market before the, the transition, and uh, and they're already beginning. So those are, that's some big rhetoric that came out that got very little coverage. Um, now, this was beautiful. By the way, this is not the action of a government that wants to start a war. This is kind of an olive branch because today, finally, I've been saying over and over and adding every week uh, that uh, the Boeing recertification was in sight. As a matter of fact, on the Bloomberg radio on Monday, the Yahoo Finance on Tuesday, and the Cheddar on uh, this morning at 7.30 a.m., I talked about Boeing as being a top pick because of two reasons. One, um, while the indices have kind of like the perception that the market has been going up all year because it's been FANG plus Microsoft exclusively, um, the industrials, small caps, reopening cyclicals have, have done nothing since May, most of them since February, and ground sideways to down ever since. And a catch-up trade is in the making. My, my, um, and then I showed how earnings, um, uh, next year, uh, the s and is expected to grow about 9% earnings. Uh, that's why we're looking for high single digits, low double digits for the general indices. But industrial sector is going to grow earnings at 36.2%. And the company we love in that context is um, Boeing. And, and I said, as all this volatility is going on, particularly like during the Yahoo one when the market was down, and the and the Bloomberg one and this morning even the futures weren't up that much um, uh, because the news hadn't come out for Boeing yet. Um, we said that a catch up trade is in the works and um, and and that you know Boeing would would have recertification. The CEO Dave Calhoun said on the third third 
quarter conference call. He had confidence that we'd get the recertification. That is nowhere near priced in is were my exact words on the call. And if you recall in the last three weeks, I said I'd be hard pressed to see a recertification happen and the stock not go up 20 or 30 percent over the following few weeks or, or a couple of months. And today alone, the stock's up 7.35 percent uh, with uh, 20 minutes to go before the closing. By the way, Baba just turned positive. So the algos realized, wait a second, we're selling this thing off on old news. But leaving that aside, um, so Boeing's production on the 737 MAX is now going to go up from 19 a month to 31 a month by, by Q1. Uh, we're going to, start to get, going to start to see orders pour in. Uh, so I'm very, very excited about this because, uh, you know, it was just felt like such a grind waiting for Boeing and waiting for BABA. So now we got one off the mat and now we're going to get BABA, I think, is, uh, is uh, finally going to get, get going here. Um, you've got the um, Investor Day meeting on December 16th and 17th. And the fact that China cleared the 737 MAX and recertified it today tells me they're, they're tired of the wars. It's not helping them. And in which case, maybe they can come to some diplomatic solution on this delisting. Because I, I got to assume the last 20 points is attributable to fear about this delisting and VIE. Because the business itself, um, you know, you're, you're buying it for 2017 prices. Revenues are up 350%. Profits have doubled. Earnings are going to go 14% next year after being uh, down a bit this year due to the regulatory crackdown. They got a plan to go from 1.24 billion users to 2, bil 2, 2 billion. You, you can't replicate this. Yeah, there'll be competition, but their AWS equivalent, the cloud, where, which is what drove the boat for all of uh, Amazon's growth, their Alley Cloud is growing faster than AWS and it's growing big time outside of China. It's just a franchise when you can buy it at these levels, the average multiple for the last 10 years has been 28 times, or eight years, it's only been public since 2014, has been 28 times earnings. It's trading at 12 and a half times next year's earnings. So all the value players are gonna step in, whether they buy it in Hong Kong or they buy it in US, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that thing's gonna get off the mat. And by the time people wake up to it, it'll be at $200 and then people will get interested around 250. And that's when we'll start peeling out 260 and probably hold the rest some at 300 and then some for the long term at 400 plus and uh and that's that and that's why you saw buffett's quote it's it money's made in the waiting and honestly most managers if they don't have the right partners they can't go through the waiting because you know people who aren't wealthy can't deal with the fluctuations they don't understand how to value a business but when you have wealthy partners they get it uh, they, they've been through it. That's why they're wealthy and, um, and they stick through the short term noise and they get the long term doubles and triples. So you just have to attract the right partners over time. And, um, okay, moving right along. Factory activity unexpectedly grows as some bottlenecks ease. We've been talking about that. Everyone was worried about that. I said that would be done probably by the end of the first quarter. It's already easing up here in the fourth quarter. Uh, macro charts put out this indicator, I guess, a couple hours ago. Um, <clears throat> McClellan Oscillator hit bottom 1% of all days since 2007. That's interesting. We had all 10. We, ha we listed these uh, last night, actually, in our article, which we'll go through when we said we think the market's going to bounce here and here's why. And we listed like 10 of these indicators. But he listed this today, massive capitulation in selling in a strong market uptrend testing support, historically a powerful bullish combination, potential big buy opportunity soon. Watch closely for the turn up. So here's his McClellan oscillator. You can see what happened all these other times, these green little dots. So that's that. Um, OK, speaking of industrials growing 32 percent earnings next year, we'll look here. Is this a good time to be buying or selling industrials? Uh, boom, it's down to. Uh, percentage of uh, S&P industrial stocks above their 20-day uh, e emerging EMA, only 2.7 exponential moving average, only 2.74% of the uh, S&P industrial stocks were above their 20-day exponential moving average uh, as of last night. And you can see in all these cases where it hit even 10%, it was a huge buying opportunity, 8%, 8%. Even during the uh, pandemic, that was when you wanted to be buying uh, before the pandemic, 4%. So, uh, and, and Boeing's one of the biggest industrials. 
up now seven, almost seven and a half percent on the day. Very exciting times. Um, okay, so let's take a look at how some of the indicators are looking right now. Uh, the equity put called 10 day moving average is closer to a buy area than a sell area. It's, it's it's peaking. We could get some more. Look, we could get a bad headline tomorrow. Like, oh, you know, five people died and market will be down 500 and we'll be saying, OK, do we have cash to buy anything? What are we going to buy? Uh, and, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll be doing that. But uh, I, I think I think we'll probably see some follow through on this bounce, um, you know, maybe a little back and fill and then a follow through in, in coming weeks. There is one risk that's bigger than Omicron is stupidity by the Fed. And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, I talked about it on Cheddar on Monday, and I'm a little worried about Chair Powell because he made a huge mistake in December of 2018 and tanked the market in December uh, 16% in, the, in 24 days. It was the worst December uh, since the Great Depression. And he knowingly continued to tighten because he had this idea in his mind that he was going to follow through on his plan um, and the data was telling him and the market was weak in October and November and he did it anyway, tanked the market. It was down 16% for the month, 25% from its recent peak, completely unnecessary. And then Steven Mnuchin, who is the best public servant we've ever had in the history of the country in terms of knowledge and skill, he came in on Christmas Eve, called all the banks together, backstopped it and turned it around just like he did in February of 2020. The problem is if Powell screws up again, we don't have Steven Mnuchin to fix the problem. Uh, he's not at the Treasury anymore. So, um, so it's worrisome and it's worrisome because he wants to accelerate taper. You know, here's a guy who spent the last year and a half convincing the world that inflation was transitory. And the second he gets reappointed, he wants to accelerate the taper. And all of a sudden, transitory is not a word. We should get rid of the word transitory. Well, you made it up, so you get rid of it. Uh, and uh, and I think it's 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 irresponsible because he doesn't have all the data on Omicron yet. I uh, won't have that for another two to two and a half weeks. And why tighten? I mean, just, just stick with your plan. You're already starting to remove liquidity. I, I know. I mean, it's a, it's a net add of liquidity until the taper's over because they're taking down the amount of liquidity that they're adding, but it's still you know above uh, zero, obviously. And, and, but um, why rush it? What what's so important about the extra three months when you have this variable that you you can't quantify before December? So. Uh, before your December 14th, 15th meeting. And uh, doing something stupid like that would be the equivalent of what he did in December of 2018. And it's just completely unnecessary. Just let it go. And if you have, you get the proper data in two weeks or four weeks, you could always either call another meeting or at the next meeting accelerate it. Once we know where we are, oh, it's another Delta, we'll get through it. Fine, we can accelerate it if we want to. I mean, it's not a big deal, but to accelerate it right now in an information vacuum is irresponsible and the market just doesn't need it. And the market told you it didn't like it this week. So don't keep doing it. It doesn't make any sense. It's going to slow growth and uh, people have enough uncertainty to deal with right now. So um, so a little disappointing from uh, in Powell since his reappointment. His actions have been gone back to the early mistakes when he was just appointed. Uh, then he mended his ways after he nearly threw the uh, economy and stock market off the cliff. Uh, and apparently he didn't learn his lessons because he he's intimating he wants to make the same mistakes a second time. So uh, let's see if he gets his his uh, act together before the 15th or, or the, before the next meeting and just say, look, I want to accelerate this. We're going to hold off until the next meeting just because we don't have complete and accurate information on Omicron. But that's where we're thinking. And that's a reasonable thing to do. And that's fine. But the other thing that I'm worried about is that you have a situation where he's fighting yesterday's war today. I mean, commodity prices have rolled over in the last 90 days. And like I said on November 4th, it works on a lagged effect. You're not going to see it in the grocery store, the fact that soybeans rolled over in the last four weeks for another three months. Same thing with lean hogs. You're not going to see it on your bacon prices until summertime. Uh, so um, that that is something that we have to be careful of to get too tight too quickly when prices are already in a self-correcting mechanism and we'll, we'll look at some of the pictures uh, in just a second. So um, 
Uh, okay, what we've got here is material stocks. Again, a lot of material stocks got slaughtered. You've got 3.5% below the their 20-day uh, exponential moving average. And uh, healthcare stocks, same thing. A lot of opportunity um, to, do, to do that. Um, so you're seeing most of these indicators are at areas that you want to buy. National Association of Active Investment Managers are still a bit overweight, so they might uh, peel down if we get some more volatility in, in coming days. We'll see. But this PMO buy all is at zero. Zero is an area where you want to start to buy, not sell. You can see it all, the, all across the way. Uh, even during the pandemic, that's where you wanted to be a buyer. And that's an indicator that I look at regularly. Same with PMO by Dow Jones Industrial, PMO by uh, S&P 500, it's down to 10. At these levels, you wanna be a buyer even during the pandemic uh, and so on and so forth. So most of these indicators are saying the risk reward in coming days and weeks favors being a net buyer. So, you know, on red days, you top up like yesterday. On green days, uh, you just sit on your knees. But here are the McClellan oscillators like Macro Charts was talking about. And we put a lot of these out last night and it was telling us to take action. So uh, that's that. Okay. Moving on to the article of the week. Um, you have... Okay, backward looking policy, forward looking opportunity. On November 4th, we made the case that commodities were starting to roll over and would uh, impact would be felt by consumers. Okay, so we just talked about that. You can see the commodities here, corn, soybeans, soybeans. So why are you tightening into prices that are rolling over? Lean hogs down from 120 to 80. Uh, oils rolled over. Um, and and the, uh, South, the OPEC just agreed to continue with their plan to increase 400,000 barrels a month. So uh, orange juice, uh, cotton, cocoa, lumber, uh, we saw crashed a few months ago, sugar's rolling over, even inflation expectations, inflation break-evens have moved down from 3.1, five-year break-evens have moved from 3.17 to 2.7 in the past two weeks. Uh, so again, um, you know, these are, this is not the time, this is the time to sit back and, and see what impact uh, the, this rolling over has on prices. Give it a few months, certainly push off the rate hikes until after summer, but even the taper, if you wanna you know, stop increasing liquidity, that's fine, but you don't have to withdraw liquidity sooner than is needed, certainly uh, not, sooner than, um, not sooner than the original plan which the market had already digested. What's the rush is, is the basic question. Um, okay, so we've gone through a lot of this about the Paxlovid, um, about the generally strong economic numbers. Uh, M2 money supply is still 2.5 trillion above the pre-pandemic trend. Um, if they stick with the current taper schedule, it'll add another 600 billion plus of additional liquidity over the next six months. If they accelerate it, it'll be less liquidity, uh, which is which is kind of the concern in the face of Omicron and rolling over prices. You know, it reminds me of, of GE. You know, GE, you saw them sell the financial services at the bottom because uh, they had to. I mean, they, they were basically stopped out. And then they bought energy at the top in 2014. And that's my fear about what Powell is doing uh, is that he's he's now, now that prices are rolling over, and growth is slowing. You know, we're going to go from 6% GDP this year to, you know, around 4% next year. Prices are rolling over. He's now tightening into that weakening. And that's generally not a great formula. Yes, move along with the taper, but do it slowly and steadily. Let the market digest and absorb it. There is no rush. Um, and, and if there is a rush, like, you know, you see commodities roll over, but, but you know, the bottlenecks aren't easing, but the bottlenecks are easing. So you're going to have all of the transitory, quote unquote, transitory parts of inflation rolling over and the non-transitory like wages, they'll just, you know, more and more labor is coming on. We saw it with the job ads today, with the job numbers today. We'll probably see it with the employment report tomorrow. We said October would be good. It was good. 
we said we said November will be good. I think that'll be good good tomorrow. Um, you know, just just do it steady and slow. Why do you have to change it all of a sudden that you're reappointed? You got to accelerate it. All, you know, stand your ground. Don't fall to the pressure of the emotional people that aren't willing to wait a few months for the effect of price rollovers to be felt in the market. Uh, that is a mistake. So. Um, it's a December 2018 mistake if you need a refresher. Um, okay, so here's the earnings data on industrials and why we think that's an opportunity. This is a recap of the China story, how uh, after these type of 30 to 35% corrections that happen every three to four years, the average return is 30% in the next 12 months uh, for the MSCI China. And ahead of the uh, China National Congress, the 12 months averages 30% as well. The regulatory uh, regulation is rolling over, according to the G uh, Goldman Sachs note. And then I did this article last night. What now? The S and P was down five percent in nine session in nine days. Uh, as it, as I stated in the Yahoo Finance clip above, in times like this, you can pull out your shopping list and ignore the short term noise that you have no control over. Powell's about face and policymakers' extreme responses to another variant uh, with their travel restrictions and nonsense. Uh, you have to look out six to 12 months and ask, quote, will the world need more or less airplanes 12 months from now? Remember, we just overcame uh, the two to three month Delta saga a month ago, uh, and Boeing is still trading 57% below, 57 below its pre-pandemic high. So it was 188 last night. I think it closed at 202. Uh, yeah, 202 and changed today up 7.5%. So that was pretty awesome uh, timing. And then I said, will Disney, will Walt Disney have more park attendance, pent up demand and more Disney Plus subscriptions 12 months from now than it has today? Disney's trading down 25% in the last three months. And what about Alibaba? The never ending selling pressure is unabated despite the fact the underlying business continues to grow. Earnings for next year will still grow 14.9% despite the aggressive and relentless regulatory crackdown of 2021. It's still growing but trading at 2017 prices despite the fact that revenues have grown 350% and profits have doubled. The multiples compressed from an average of 28 times to now 12 and a half times forward. They've got 1.24 billion users with a plan to exceed 2 billion. This is not a franchise that's easily replicated or duplicated and their cloud business is growing faster than AWS. So you can tell I've thought about that once or twice times. Uh, I can repeat it in my sleep. Uh, do we know when any of these bargains will turn? Nope. Well, today we found out that Boeing finally turned. So that's one down, a few to go. But we're betting soon. And if you buy the highest quality franchises in the world when they're on sale, you're amply rewarded, even when it takes a bit longer than you expected due to exogenous events outside your control. Time is your hedge. And when they turn, it comes big and it comes all at once. On Wednesday, there was an interesting graphic on CNBC halftime show. Took this picture with my cell phone. And basically what it is, the summary is buy laggards in December as they outperform over the next 12 months. They took the data from 2011 to 2020 and measured stocks that had fallen 10% or more through the end of November. If you bought them on December 1st and held the next 12 months, the average return was 18.7% or 4.3% greater than the S&P 500. There are a number of short-term indicators that point to a near-term bounce, but we will need confirmation from the Omicron data and the Fed decision before knowing if any new bounces are sustainable short term. That's why our focus is to take advantage of buying only the whole highest quality businesses that we believe will be bigger six to 12 months from now, regardless of what Omicron and the Fed do in the short term. Here are a few of the indicators that I'm looking at right now that are saying that odds favor a bounce in coming sessions. So this I put out last night before the 700, 600 point rally on the Dow. Uh, the VIX was over 30. You saw the... Uh, NYSE advanced decline volume line. I mean, this was a no-brainer, negative 32.50. The NYSE McClellan oscillator was down here at 80. You can see every time that you bought it in those levels, you got paid nicely. Um, bullish percent of the S&P 500 was below 50%. That's been a solid buying uh, place. Same with the NASDAQ advanced decline down below 22.50. The uh, McClellan oscillator was the negative 80. Again, these have been buy opportunities, not sell opportunities. Same with the advanced decline NASDAQ. 
uh, advanced decline issues for the NYSE was down below 2000. That was a buy, that was a buy, that was a buy, et cetera, et cetera. The PMO buy all, one of my favorites, was at zero. And the PMO DJIA, we've got covered a bunch of these. The PMO SP buy SPY was at 10. Again, buy all around. The NYSE 10% volume index was at negative 200. That's been a buy point the last half dozen times. Uh, and the uh, AAII bulls, uh, retail bullish sentiment was wiped out. Fear and greed was at 22. This extreme level, 10 to 20, is a buy versus sell. Uh, you can see it all the way back through the last two years here. And uh, we're using the short-term volatility to buy add to high-quality franchises that will grow over the next 6 to 12 months to, despite policy and virus surprises along the way. We do it steadily, methodically, on down days and not all at once. Here's the economic data of the week. Pending home sales beat on Monday. Um, you saw a, uh, let's see, manufacturing, oh, crude oil inventories had a draw of uh, 900,000 barrels, expected to draw 1.2, so less than expected. Uh, continuing claims uh, went down again, which is why I think tomorrow's jobs report will be good. Initial jobless claims came in less than expected, 222 versus 240, and that's all the uh, data for this week. So, uh, so good, good week. One down, a couple to go. Uh, now we're waiting for uh, Baba to have its day in the sun. Uh, we don't know when, but we do know it will. Whether whether you own it through U.S. or, or Hong Kong, uh, and um, and this is a nice uh, start. So big bounce today. Tomorrow we probably get a little bit of a scare, and then we should get some follow through moving into year to year end as we get uh, more more data on Omicron, and hopefully the Fed uh, uh, stays reasonable and uh, lets this uh, recovery work a little bit before getting too antsy, particularly since prices have been rolling over for the last 90 days. So with that said, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Happy holidays to everyone and make it a great one. Bye for now.